Hello, hello, thank you for joining me. Uh, this is my final day reading the quotes that most moved me from book 15, Stani's Love Graphs, The Cosmic Game. I've included a link in the notes in the case that you'd like to see more details about the book. These final pages include a focus on a number of rich subjects. I've taken notes on those to give you the highlights. Loopholes in the Cosmic Dance, Reincarnation, an entire chapter is titled The Taboo Against Knowing Who We Are. Yes, quoting Alan Watts. <laughs> Free Will, The Application of Enlightenment to Well-Being, Evil, Violence, and Aggression, Death, and Organized Religion. Both the world in which reincarnation seems impossible and the one where it seems to be an undeniable fact are virtual realities created by orchestration of experiences. For this reason, the cosmic game can include scripts that from our limited everyday perspective might appear to be incompatible and in conflict with each other. In the universal mind and its divine play, they can coexist without any problem. The creative intention behind the divine play is to call into being experiential realities that would offer the best opportunities for adventures in consciousness. One of the important tasks on the spiritual journey is to be able to see the divine not only in the extraordinary and ordinary, but also in the lowly and ugly. Einstein is God impeccably impersonating Albert Einstein, and a chimpanzee is God playing perfectly the role of a chimpanzee. The ways leading out of self-deception to enlightenment and to reunion with the source present serious problems, and most of the potential loopholes in creation are carefully hidden. This is absolutely necessary for the maintenance of stability and balance in the cosmic scheme. These vicissitudes and pitfalls of the spiritual path represent an important part of the taboo against knowing who we are. The dogmas and activities of mainstream religions tend to obscure the fact that the only place where true spirituality can be found is inside the psyche of each of us. The participation in the cosmic game requires that the units of consciousness forget their true identity, assume a separate individuality, and perceive and treat other protagonists as fundamentally different from themselves. The creative process generates many domains with different characteristics, and each of them offers unique opportunities for exquisite adventures in consciousness. The extent and degree of free choice that we have as protagonists on the different levels of the cosmic game decreases as consciousness descends from the absolute to the plane of material existence and increases in the course of the spiritual return journey. Since by our true nature, we are unlimited spiritual beings, we enter the cosmic game on the basis of a free decision and get trapped by the perfection with which it is executed. The vital emergency, pain, and suffocation experienced for many hours during our delivery generate enormous amounts of anxiety and murderous aggression that remains stored in our psyche and body. Aggression is not something that reflects our true nature, but rather a screen that separates us from it, skipping down. Deep inner self-exploration leads regularly to a major reduction of aggression and of self-destructive tendencies, as well as an increase of tolerance and compassion. It also tends to foster reverence for life, empathy for other species, and ecological sensitivity. Whatever might be the reality of the present circumstances, the situation never seems satisfactory and the solution always appears to lie in the future. Like the fetus stuck and struggling in the birth canal, we feel a strong need to get to a situation that is better than the present one. As a result of this compelling drive towards some future accomplishment, we never live fully in the present, and our life feels like a preparation for something better to come. 
the deepest motivating force in the human psyche on all the levels of our development is the craving to return to the experience of our divinity. However, the constraining conditions of the incarnate existence do not allow the experience of full spiritual liberation in and as God. The divine is the principal offering reunion for the separated, but also the agent responsible for the division and separation of the original unity. If this principle were complete and self-fulfilling in itself, there would not be any reason for it to create and the other experiential realms would not exist. Since they do, the tendency of absolute consciousness to create clearly expresses a fundamental need. The worlds of plurality thus represent an important complement to the undifferentiated state of the divine. In the terminology of the Kabbalah, people need God and God needs people. One part of us, the holotropic one, wishes to transcend the identification with the body ego and experience disillusion and union with a larger whole. The other part, the hylotropic one, is driven by the fear of death and by the self-preservation instinct to hold on to our separate identity. This conflict is extremely difficult and can represent a serious obstacle in the process of psycho-spiritual transformation. Awareness of our divine nature and of the essential emptiness of all things that we discover in our transpersonal experiences form the foundations of a meta framework that can help us considerably to cope with the complexity of everyday existence. We can fully embrace the experience of the material world and enjoy all that it has to offer, the beauty of nature, human relationships, love-making, family, works of art, sports, culinary delights, and countless other things. The current global crisis is of a psycho-spiritual nature. It is therefore hard to imagine that it could be resolved without a radical inner transformation of humanity and its rise to a higher level of emotional maturity and spiritual awareness. The belief that religion and science have to be mutually incompatible reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of both. Correctly understood, True science and authentic religion are two important approaches to existence that are complementary and do not in any way compete with each other. The origin of consciousness from matter is simply assumed as an obvious and self-evident fact based on the belief in the primacy of matter in the universe. In the entire history of science, nobody has ever offered a plausible explanation how consciousness could be generated by material processes, or even suggested a viable approach to the problem. There actually exists ample evidence suggesting exactly the opposite, namely that consciousness can under certain circumstances operate independently of its material substrate and can perform functions that reach far beyond the capacities of the brain. This is most clearly illustrated by the existence of out-of-body experiences. These can occur spontaneously or in a variety of facilitating situations that include shamanic trance, psychedelic sessions, hypnosis, experiential psychotherapy, and particularly near-death situations. Once religion becomes organized, it often completely loses the connection with its spiritual source and becomes a secular institution exploiting the human spiritual needs without satisfying them. Instead, it creates a hierarchical system focusing on the pursuit of power, control, politics, money, possessions, and other secular concerns. If somebody in our culture has a spiritual experience of the kind that inspired every major religion in the world, an average minister will very likely send him or her to a psychiatrist. In visionary states, the experiences of other realities or of new perspectives on our everyday reality are so convincing and compelling that the individuals who have had them have no other choice than to incorporate them into their worldview.
It is thus systematic experiential exposure to non-ordinary states of consciousness on the one side and the absence thereof on the other that sets the technological societies and pre-industrial cultures ideologically so far apart. I have not yet met a single individual who has had a deep experience of the transcendental realms and continues to subscribe to the worldview of Western materialistic science. This development is quite independent of the level of intelligence, type and degree of education, and professional credentials of the individuals involved. Concluding quote, if any of the critics of transpersonal psychology succeed in presenting a convincing, sober, and down-to-earth materialistic explanation of the extraordinary world of holotropic experiences, I will be the first one to welcome it and congratulate them.